Franklin County Fair has been part of our community for more than 170 years. It has always been owned and operated by an organization of neighbors known as the Franklin County Agricultural Society. Here is our familiar modern day fairgrounds, but did you know that this is actually the fair's third home location? Why has this become a tradition known to so many generations? What makes this so important that it still continues in our modern and changing world? Let's have some fun exploring these questions and celebrate our latest opportunity to share in the experience. The idea of forming American agricultural societies had been around since the late 1700s, but none of these early efforts ever really reached the farms or got the farmers themselves involved. Massachusetts began to subsidize county organized societies, but only if the applying group met a minimum population requirement, which wasn't possible at the time for single Connecticut Valley communities. In 1818, Hampshire, Franklin, and Hamden counties combined forces and successfully applied to the state as a three-county society. Their first cattle show was held that same year in Northampton. It was intended to support area farming by offering cash prizes, known as premiums, for the best entries in each of the categories offered. The winner would be required to share their secrets and thereby improve the general quality of farming in the valley. For a time, this was the best possible option. It was a terrible distance for a Franklin farmer to travel. Transporting stock over long distances was very costly. A farmer would also need to pay lodging and board, not to mention the loss of several days' work. Under protest, the society did organize events in Greenfield a couple of times, but these were not regular, despite their successes for local Franklin farmers. Over the years, local Greenfield businessman, Henry Wells Clapp, heard and understood much about the benefits a local society would be for Greenfield and Franklin County. The subject was impossible to avoid. One chorus of voices seemed to originate from the efforts of General Amos Newport. 
an elderly African-American employee of CLAPS. During his life, the general seemed to be a popular man and was an active player in town events such as Revolutionary War reenactments. While in his 70s, he would walk to the agricultural shows in Northampton and Worcester. Once returning, he would tell any willing to listen about all the wonderful crowds, commerce, and activity stimulated by these fairs, and the benefit it would be to Franklin if we were to do the same thing here. A local printer offered to print handbills promoting the idea if Mr. Newport were to circulate them around town. After eagerly accepting the offer, many joined in the chatter about a Franklin County show. Local citizens and business leaders organized the first Greenfield Cattle Show in 1848 and again in 1849 with the help of Mr. Clapp and his wife Anna. These were held on the town common. The second show was more successful and better organized than the first, so in 1850 the Franklin County Agricultural Society was legally incorporated with Mr. Clapp being elected as its first president. This broadside is advertising the first show sponsored by the Society. This original copy may be viewed today at the Fair Museum. These first fairs were centered on the Greenfield Town Common. This would include Clay Hill, known today as Bank Row, and east on Main Street to near the Hairpin Turn at High Street. The core of the event was in the competition for the best farm products the county could produce. A condition for entry was that you were willing to share your secrets and methods so that the area's farming output would improve. This livestock show offered cash prizes, known as premiums, for many categories, including many varieties of cattle and oxen, horses, sheep, poultry, and swine. A so-called manufacturer's exhibit was for a long time held in the old Washington Hall on Main Street. This was Greenfield's town hall building at the time and served the same purpose as we know the modern fairs roundhouse is used today. There were originally two competitive spectacles, the ox pole 
and the precision plowing. In a world without engines, oxen and horses were heavily relied on to provide labor and transportation. A team capable of drawing a great weight was highly prized, and many labors of the farm would have been impossible without them. This competition was held up Clay Hill. The other crowd drawing event was the plowing competition. This was held at a nearby field loaned for the purpose. Each contestant would be given a piece of land to plow. Unlike races, this event was judged on the quality and precision of the work rather than the speed in which it was completed. Today we might be surprised to learn that some of these events drew over a thousand spectators. After concluding the exhibition events, a parade was organized and marched around the town center, ending at the old brick church, also known as the Second Congregational Church, whose pastor was once Lorenzo Langstroth, the father of modern beekeeping. Inside the church, a service and dedication followed, ending with the presentation of awards for all the earlier competitions. The Society's Agricultural Banquet followed, which would be held at either of the big Main Street hotels, the American House or later the Mansion House. Those with the remaining energy might go on to celebrate the evening with a ballroom dance social. This formula for an in-town fair worked for a time, but both problems as well as opportunities gradually became apparent. It was great that the show was a big attraction, but soon came many street vendors and others eager to make money off the crowds. Of course, the society would also like to make money, and having the fair in downtown Greenfield wasn't exactly a good way of controlling the many visitors or who might manage what was sold to them. Perhaps the society's frustration peaked in 1856 when the Welch and Lent Circus came up Clay Hill with their marching band at noon while the church presentation was underway. They carried away with them a large portion of the cattle show's crowd. Also, the show's biggest attractions had been the draft animal poles and plowing competition. These were also beginning to lose interest after several years, and it became obvious that the town's day visitors wanted to be entertained. This was answered by adding more fun events, like the greased pig catching contest. Another favorite would be horse racing. Ultimately, holding the show on the society's own fairgrounds would be the best answer. In 1856, the Greenfield Trotting Park was established above town on Petty Plain. Their proprietors hoped to become a seasonal attraction in their own right and began attracting competitive racers from all over New England with the promise of cash prizes offered to the winners. The society immediately arranged to hold fair-sponsored events at the park and such an arrangement probably helped both groups well by promoting Greenfield and Franklin County as a center of activity. This gave the fair a much needed added attraction to satisfy their public. Unfortunately, it was a considerable distance from the other fair events, and we will reveal a bit later how this location actually became ideal for the society. Most of us are pretty familiar of where the fair is located today, but the story of how it eventually got there is pretty interesting. It is a rather strange mix of necessity, luck, and events that came down in history. As we mentioned, the first fairs were centered in town. The center of activity was at the Common, the surrounding town center, and what is today known as Bank Row. 
The Society finally succeeded in buying its first park location at the Green River Meadows in time for the 1861 show. It would finally have grounds under its full control, solving most of the problems we already mentioned. It is very interesting to see how well this rare map of the first fairgrounds matches up and fits into this larger 1885 map of Greenfield. These old maps are rarely accurate by today's standards, and leads one to even think these features we see may also be accurate in the details they describe. It must have been the answer to many dreams and prayers. There were exhibition pens, a grandstand, and other amenities and security measures. It is all self-contained in one location, so there is little risk of having a renegade circus pulling away your audience or experiencing an unwelcome invasion of street vendors. The timing of the new fairground was also fortunate for the society because the terrible American Civil War had started. The Greenfield Trotting Park was closed and converted into Camp Miller, a military base to muster in and train the Massachusetts Union Volunteers who would soon be sent to battle in the South. It would be the new fairground park that would continue horse racing in Greenfield. The fair continued to grow in the 1860s and even expanded the park in 1863. The fairgrounds now extended nearly to the bank of the Green River. Major changes, challenges, and opportunities were soon to come to the community of Franklin County. They would have direct impact on the agricultural society. A new industrial community was being developed in Turner's Falls. Many of the county's sons and daughters would soon be moving off the farms for the new cash-paying jobs which were being created. The county's population would continue to surge, with new residents even coming from abroad to make a new life in Greenfield and Montague. All of these people, of course, needed to eat, so the farms of Franklin would have new markets and challenges to meet the demands of a growing community. For the society, there was another, more immediate problem. A long-needed rail route to Albany was finally under construction thanks to the engineering miracle of the new Hoosick Tunnel. Some of this rail construction would need to cut right across the fairgrounds and other Greenfield properties. Here is an 1870s photo of the Green River Meadows just below the center of town. Follow the red arrow in this picture and you will see what appears to be a railroad bed. It became obvious that the society would yet again need to find a new home for the fairgrounds. So, on America's centennial year, the fair opens at a new location, a huge new space able to accommodate 20 herds of cattle, 500 sheep, and many horses to pound their hooves on the new racetrack. All of this, plus in the grove, will be the spring dance floor, ready for you to dance to the tune of Professor Putnam's violins. Where? Why, up in Petty Plain, at the location once used by the Trotting Park and then Camp Miller. The iconic roundhouse has been a favorite landmark of the fair for more than 120 years. It is connected with a man whose legacy extends far beyond this society. He and his family were not farmers. Rather, they were inventors, businessmen, and creators of industry. His name was Frank Orrin Wells and was born in Shelburne in 1855. Here he is in his entry for the 1897 coaching parade which was the name given to the new parade idea to promote the fair all around town. 
Wells was president of the society in 1900. His career was connected with his brother Fred, who with their father formed a company known as Wells Brothers. Later, he would become the central figure in forming a new company, which would be called Greenfield Tap and Die, and was responsible for bringing wealth and jobs into Franklin County for over a century. Wells is also responsible for the Weldon Hotel on High Street. Originally intended for employees of GTD and company visitors, it was quickly converted into the last of the major privately operated hotels in Greenfield. The other Wells donated landmark to the fair is the main gate, which also has become familiar to generations. It is important to notice that neither Wells nor Henry Wells Clapp were farmers. Both were leading citizens and businessmen, which understood that investing time for their greater home community was important. Donating some of their time and resources to the Agricultural Society was good for home. Much of the wealth and commerce created by these men continued to benefit Franklin County for generations. Known formally as Exhibition Hall, the Roundhouse took over the function which had first began at Washington Hall in downtown Greenfield. The display of the county's crafts and produce industries now had a permanent front seat at the fairgrounds. It is obvious from watching this album that little has changed in that purpose for all the generations this landmark has now stood. Oh boy, the Midway! What do I need to say? It has probably been one of the most chaotic and confusing social situations that our community has had to offer for generations. I wonder how practical texting is on the Midway. Do your earliest memories as a child include a visit here while being escorted by your parents or grandparents? Were you big enough to be let on all the rides you wanted to get on? Scared of any? What about all that good food? I bet your mom didn't serve all of that stuff at home. Nearby were our town merchants and service providers. Our churches would have a presence, and politics and causes would make their appearances. There is also the various games and arcades. Do you think this young man really wanted a teddy bear? Or was it really the fun of winning it that tempted him? Thank you! What are we able to see today that would be familiar to a visitor of the 1800s? What human needs are still being served in people's lives, which were the same needs as what people felt a century ago? Is there any completely different purpose that has been added, or an old one which has been since removed? Might this possibly be the same enduring fare? which is able to continually adapt itself to the times. Parades have been around since the beginning, with the march around the town center just before the church dedication and awards presentation. 
Some are held at the fairgrounds and may have special themes, such as for a tribute to our firefighters and law enforcement. In 1893, a new idea was put into action and first became known as the Coaching Parade. This event would tour all around town on the fair's opening day in the same manner that a circus parade would announce itself when first coming to town. Here are a few of the 1897 participants. A Living Seal of the Society, played by Miss Frances Saxton. The Marshals. The Continentals, comprising a team of 50 boys. Mrs. Brooks and Mrs. Hollister. The prize-winning pumpkin for that year. Not really. And much more than we could mention by name. So here is our main tribute to all the fair parades through time. The premium competitions for best livestock and produce continue pretty much as they have been since the 1840s. It is great to see how many young people are involved. The experience they gain in practice will serve them in life, even if they do not decide to pursue farming as a career. The value might be in the learning of personal responsibility at a young age and that a pursuit for excellence is real and strengthens character. The successes of it may then be shared with others so that all may benefit from each of our individual achievements. I can remember my grandfather taking me to one of these as a boy. I saw him speak and interact with everybody. I was then introduced and was also expected to interact with these strangers using all of my skills of communication and courtesy. Mind you, these were not next door neighbors or family members known to me, but complete strangers. I wasn't six years old. I can still remember all of this, plus the exciting chaos of the fair, now more than 60 years later. How many little kids were introduced to their first goat during the pandemic year? How many of the rest of us missed out on personal interaction with others? Perhaps we live in a time when such practices need to be deliberately pursued. Perhaps the biggest changes over time have been at the midway. Technology and changing interest certainly seems to have had an effect on that. Our crystal ball has only offered a few early peaks of the fairgrounds in action, but it does reveal some big differences from what we know today. 
This view was probably taken before 1899. The roundhouse does not appear, there are no automobiles to be seen, and folks are parking anywhere they wish, especially along the track where racing seems to be the main attraction. If we take a closer look into what we know as the Midway area, we see a different crowd of people who are all focused around the tents, big banners, and canopies. Do you notice anything missing? Where are the rides? Before our world of mechanization and electricity, perhaps the only ride attraction would have been the pony ride. It was a simple formula. Just drop your little sister into a saddle and away you go. Our mechanized world was just awakening during the 1890s, and even the term Midway wasn't used until the year of the historic Columbia Exposition at Chicago in 1893. This early World's Fair also featured a new attraction intended to rival the Eiffel Tower. Named after its inventor, the Ferris Wheel was a big hit and different versions were quickly built and spread around the country. Our next view of the Midway may be from around 1920. We can now see some big new attractions. It looks like the familiar chaos we know today has made a good start in this photo. The original fair events were intended to be competition and sharing of farm methods and production, but folks immediately began to crowd the poles and plowing because they wanted to be entertained. Crowds were good for business, so more entertainment events were added over time. Some would be spectacle contests you could compete in, while others were professional acts which were only intended to enjoy. Along the midway, you might see professional exhibits or sideshows. These promoters would pay the society for a space at the fair and then charge admission for the public to see a small show or exhibit. One example would be the Avery Oxen, which were owned by James Avery of Buckland. In the 1890s, his giant oxen once pulled a record 11,284 pounds in a sled pull competition. He later put them on exhibit and charged a dime to let folks stare at them. Many other kinds of professional acts would also appear over the years, much like, well, The firefighters muster has a parade that celebrates the heroes which protect our homes and lives, often displaying different gear covering a span of many years. 
It is also a team competition that relies on skills they use during some of our community's most perilous moments. illustrate two events from different generations, back to back. Here the modern team deploys their equipment and rescues a victim while winding through a labyrinth of perilous obstacles. Now watch as the 1957 crew ascends a dangerous tower and saves the laundry from certain destruction. Of course, the marksmanship of a firefighter is in hitting the target with the fire hose in record time. Watch as both teams compete by using their skills. Spectacle competition is not limited to the pros or even to the grown ups. The older kids have the option of competing in a later event. <laughs> 